You now turn in your uh, Bibles to the uh, Old Testament scriptures as the uh, reading of the Word of God tonight will be uh, taken from a very familiar psalm, Psalm 46. beginning at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth, He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. And may God add his special blessing, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, in the reading of his word. Psalm 46. Congregation, our theme tonight, this is stated in the bulletin, is it trusting in God in troublous times, or we could say trusting in God, trusting God when there is capital T, trouble. Now you all know from uh, your reading and your uh, study and exposure to the Reformation history that in times of uh, trouble, It was uh, usual for Martin Luther to exhort his good friend, Philip Melanchthon. And he would often say to them when they were uh, under the gun, when they were in the midst of uh, pending black despair, come Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm. So this Psalm that we're dealing with here tonight is indeed for the church because God is the Lord or the God of Jacob, which is a refrain that's found twice here in Psalm 46, ending in verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, and also in verse 7. Now that means when we say that God is the God of Jacob, it may sound a little bit strange to you, but certainly at the very minimum it means that God is a God of grace, of sovereign grace. God said of uh, Jacob, remember, before he was born, and of Esau, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, in Romans chapter 9. And we know, of course, that men of uh, great pride and of rebellion against God do not accept that. They say something like this, it's unfair, it's very unfair that God didn't choose Esau as well. But, of course, the right biblical mindset is that of the Calvinist. The Calvinist says something like this. I can understand how God hated Esau, but I can't understand how God loved Jacob. Now, Psalm 46 is often called Luther's Psalm, which, in a sense, is uh, not quite correct. It was his in the sense that he was inspired to write his great hymn, Eine Feste Berg, or A Mighty Fortress is Our God, the battle hymn of the Reformation. And of course it was his because he sang it, and he sang it heartily, and he sang it with Melanchthon heartily. But his uh, favorite psalm, for those of you that are interested in church history trivia, was Psalm 118. Psalm 118, of which he wrote the following words, But this psalm is the nearest my heart, and I have a familiar right 
to call it my own. Now, because of Luther's endorsement of Psalm 46, this psalm has been meticulously worked over by zealous scribes and even by uh, ecclesiastical comedians. The most famous uh, theory is that of the King James translators that they wanted to plug William Shakespeare. So it was said that uh, with uh, stealth that they translated the 46th word from the beginning, shake, and the 46th word from the end, spear, equaling Shakespeare. They wanted to uh, promote Shakespeare's writings. And added to that, this is also given as a sort of infallible proof that said that Shakespeare was 46 years old in 1611 when the King James translators um, uh, presented the authorized versions. So it seems that the Puritans had no love for Shakespeare and the Anglicans had no love for the Puritans and so it's thought that this was an Anglican conspiracy. But I don't, uh, I, I certainly don't know. I don't, in fact, to give very little credence to this because what is often forgotten is that the King James translators relied upon the Geneva Bible of 1560. And in the Geneva Bible of 1560, it also contains the words shake and spear. So we can drop that theory altogether as pure nonsense. But what's striking about this psalm is its vivid depiction of trouble. Verses 1 through 3 underscore the trouble, capital T trouble, even in nature in the creation. Verse 6 highlights the rage of the heathen against the church and against God. And verse 9 depicts the nations at war with, with, uh, with global devastations. Now, what exactly was the trouble that the psalmist is speaking about here? Well, there were, there were great upheavals, fierce warring against God's church, and there were these dislocations in the creation. And the concluding verses of the psalm seem to, uh, uh, re seem to be referring to some kind of war, because it talks about the desolations which brought about uh, the peace. But what war? That's the question. Now, a good conjecture, and it is only a conjecture, is that the war highlights the Assyrian invasion of Israel, which is uh, depicted for us in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19. This was a time when Sennacherib's forces, 185,000 soldiers came, and it appeared that Israel, the city of God, was about to be chucked into the ash can of history. So Israel had more than one problem. They had 185,000 problems. But then entered the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord would attend to business. God promised to put his hook into the nose of Sennacherib, and he says, my bridle in your lips, and to turn back Sennacherib. And that's exactly what happened. When an invader literally put a hook in your nose and, and, and pulled you, pulled your nose, you became very compliant and willing. And that's a, a picture of uh, God's sovereignty over Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. Always remembering now God's enemies are putty in his hands. The hope of defeating God is like red ants trying to invade and take over the Pentagon. It's just impossible, just impossible. And Sennacherib in Assyria also fits the city context of Psalm 48, a sister psalm, especially in verses 4 through 6, where God promises to defend his city. Listen to what he says. For behold, the kings assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled. They hasted away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in great travail. And we receive the uh, infallible explanation as to why God defended his city in 2 Kings 19, verse 34, where the Lord says, For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. David's sake. 
Now that explanation is huge. That's huge because it gives you a Christ-centered perspective of 2 Kings 19 as well as Psalm 46. Everything that God does is for my servant David's sake. That is for the promises, the Davidic covenant that he entered into, a messianic title, Jesus Christ himself being the son of David. So you see that God protects his city because of his covenant and because of his promise of the future Messiah to save us, to redeem us from all of our sins. So congregation, there's sort of a Christ-centered explanation for this city psalm. Now the outline of the psalm tonight is, going to, is, is following. First of all, we're going to look at uh, the idea of trusting in, in, in the God who is your strength in the midst of trouble. Then we're going to look at trust in the God who sends you the trouble and then trust the God who sustains you in the trouble and then finally trusting the God who slays the troublers in verses 8 and following. And remember that while God may send you trouble, you're not to be troubled because God will trouble the troublers. God will trouble them and reduce them to rubble uh, as he does with all of the attackers against his church which is echoed in our psalm in John 14 again. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now let me just say by way of clarification, when trouble comes into your life, that doesn't mean that you become a stoic, you know, indifferent, and it wouldn't, giving a wooden, uh, a wooden response. You may be troubled. You may be rightly troubled by that trouble that comes into your life, but the important thing is not to be conquered by the trouble, not to be overrun by the trouble. Just like fear. You may have, you may there be things that you fear, but you're not to be conquered by the fear. So this psalm teaches that when the earth quakes, your hearts shouldn't quake, because the Lord is on your side. All right, let's take then a look at the psalm itself, verses one through three. Trust the God who's your strength in the midst of trouble. This means, as I just said, that God is a covenant God. The psalmist doesn't say that God is my refuge, my strength, but God is our refuge and strength. So you have no right to claim this psalm as your own if you're a hypocrite or an unbeliever. This psalm isn't for what one of our members in Sacramento uh, if I can just uh, import a little of that um, into this church. One of our members in Sacramento uh, refers to certain kinds of Christians as stealth Christians. They will never witness for Christ. They're stealth Christians. And this psalm is also not for nominal Christians, for those who name the, the name of Christ, but who have not departed from their iniquities. So there's a warning right from the very beginning. Don't apply this psalm to yourself unless you have closed with Christ, trusting in his blood. If you've come to Jesus for salvation, if you've repented of all of your sins and trust in his covenant blood on the cross, then you can take a patent out on this psalm. It belongs to you. It's yours by grace because you've been saved by grace. Let me just say that making God your refuge doesn't mean that, you're, that he's your crutch or a cloak. A lot of people will use the Christian faith as a cloak or as a crutch. Many years ago, back in the 18th century, Pastor Roland Hill, an English pastor uh, who ministered the gospel, was known for his uh, great preaching, and he was also known for his sense of humor. And uh, one day, one Lord's Day, he was preaching in a chapel during a heavy rainstorm. And suddenly a number of people took shelter in the chapel where he was preaching. From the pulpit, Roland Hill made some comments. Here's what he said. He said, people who make religion their cloak are rightly censored, but I consider those who make it their umbrella are not much better. A refuge is no umbrella or cloak. God isn't an umbrella, a busboy or a bellhop who changes your tires or attends to your automotive needs when you make an occasional pit stop. That's not what this psalm is teaching. 
And this means that the God that you trust is an is God. Psalmist says God is our refuge and strength, with emphasis on is, the present tense. Your God is not a chameleon who's affected by change. God is and always will be the same. This is always the starting place of our faith. As I quoted from Hebrews this morning, without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Must believe that he is, that is, that he is present to help you in whatever your need is. Remember, a hearty faith confesses in the present moment the ever-present God. Now, this isn't the attitude of the unbeliever. The unbeliever has a past God, and he may have a future God, but he has no present God. An unbeliever might re remember the past and even anticipate good things for the future, but he denies that God is operative in his life in the present. Just can't understand why this particular trouble has come upon him. He's unwilling to accept that. He may say that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and tomorrow, when scripture says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. True faith in Christ focuses on the present God for the present trouble. Our God, our God is, the, is the great I am that I am. He is not the great was or the great shall be alone, but the great I am that I am. If you're a Christian, you don't sing, a mighty fortress was our God, do you? You see, unbelief commits deicide. It declares God in the, in the present, uh, it, uh, God in the present extremity. But that's the, 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 the genius of, of unbelief. It tries to wipe out God, every remembrance of God in the present extremity. This even happened to Martin Luther, you remember, in a very low moment in his life, whatever the trouble was, it's a famous story, but let's tell it again. He was so engulfed in a, in a black hole of depression. This continued for many days so that his wife, Katerina, decided to dress up like a widow wearing black. Finally, Luther questioned her funereal wardrobe, you remember, and then she explained to him that his attitude was so despondent, so dis discouraging, that was, it was as if God had died. Well, Luther should have exhorted his wife, come, Catherine, let us sing the 46th Psalm. Or perhaps Catherine should have exhorted him, let us come and sing. Now, the second point I bring to your attention tonight is you're to trust the God who sends you trouble. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Paul says, there has no trial taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will, with the trial, also make a way to escape, that you might be able to bear it. Now, why do troubles come? And from whom do they come? Is God spectating and no more? No. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that he sends the trouble. He sends the trouble. Not only the escape from the trouble, but he sends the trouble, the trial as well. I like to say that God plays his piano of providence with both major and minor keys. And we all know that the minor key is the, is the, is the key of sadness. But notice here the words, he will, he will with the trial, with the trial, that comes from him as well, make a way of escape. Both the escape and the trial originate with God. So God doesn't just spectate. No, he dictates events. For example, in verse 8, you're even, you're even told there that the desolations, the desolations on the earth are ascribed to God. Come behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. So you see the desolations are a product of his own sovereignty as well. 
Now that God is a present help in trouble, the present help in trouble, that, that he is the one that, that sends, helps us whenever we experience the ringer. Scripture teaches that we're born into trouble, that we're born for trouble. In fact, we can say that we're born again for trouble. As Job says, said in Job chapter 5, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. A very graphic statement there by Job. If you're a, a fan of uh, literature and William Defoe, you have uh, undoubtedly read the Robinson Crusoe. Well, let me uh, <clears throat> remind, uh, remind you of something happen that ha happened in that story. Do you recall that when Robinson Crusoe first landed on the island after his shipwreck, what happened to him? Well, he was washed up on the shore, and the story we're told that he opened up the pages of the Bible and was greeted with some words from Psalm 50, verse 15. Call unto me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. In fact, C.H. Spurgeon referred to the 15th verse of Psalm 50 as the Robinson Crusoe text. Spurgeon himself, if you know anything about his life, experienced many, many troubles, great, uh, great troubles. He even reached the point where he decided to write Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, and, and, and to pin the words on the wall in his bedroom. Those words are, God said, I have refi refined you, but not with silver. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Spurgeon's whole life was a life of trouble. In fact, when asked by a newspaper reporter or someone like that if he was in hot water again, Spurgeon said, no, I'm not in hot water. I'm the one that makes the water hot. But we are promised trouble. Jesus echoes that same thought in the Sermon on the Mount. Sufficient unto the day is the trouble or the evil thereof in uh, verse 34, Matthew chapter 6. So let me prepare you for the events of this week. Every day is an evil day. Every day is freighted with trouble. Every day is a day of temptation to commit sin. And uh, pretending that, it, that that's not going to happen is not the right answer. Of course, God doesn't, hasn't called you to stew in your troubles. There is an escape. This, this text in 1 Corinthians promises there's, there is always a state, uh, an escape. A Christian can never alibi and say that there was no way for me to avoid this temptation. There is always an avenue of escape. Now, the Lord, we're told here, is a refuge and strength in the trouble. A refuge is a retreat from pending danger. It's a place of safety when Mars crashes into planet Earth. And it's a shelter to hide when the thunder thunders and the lightning cackles and the sea roars. And when it seems like the light at the end of the tunnel, as they say on Wall Street, is a gorilla with a flashlight. God, during those moments, is your refuge and your strength. And this word strength must not be misunderstood. Here we come to a common misunderstanding. The meaning isn't that, isn't that uh, strength to perform some Herculean task like Charles Atlas, you know, uh, lifting the planet. No, the strength that God promises is an inward strength, a strength to endure the trouble, just as Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. That is, strengthens me to meet the trouble head on. Now the psalmist isn't finished yet in his introductory description of God here. He says that God is a very present help in trouble as well. God is an, an exceeding help in trouble, very exceeding help in trouble. God never underachieves. He, over, uh, he always overachieves. Or better, if I can put it a different way, God never, God never overachieves, overachieves because 
you always expect him to overachieve. There's, there's, there's no way that we can overstate God's faithfulness to us. It's impossible. Now, this overkill language here should kill off any unbelief that lurks within our own hearts. God is an exceeding strength in the midst of trump, uh, trouble, and that should trump all of all tendencies for unbelief and doubts that we might have. Now, if all of this is so, and indeed it is because it's found in the Holy Scriptures, this entitles you to make a glorious deduction, to use logic. In one verse, you have the identity of those who say God is our refuge and strength. Then you have a declaration about God himself. He is followed by a description of God as our refuge and strength. And now comes the great deduction of faith. Faith trashes the fear, you see. Well, if you look at verse 2 here, the psalmist begins with the word, Therefore, therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, and though its mountains roar and be troubled, though the waters shake with the swelling thereof. Now, what were the circumstances of this great, of his deduction of faith? Well, the psalmist illustrates the trouble with the earth, because the earth symbolizes the one thing that means a lot to us, and that is permanence. You know, you can put your feet on the ground, a solid ground. You get, you get security, you feel security. But it's interesting, he chooses what seems to represent permanence to illustrate impermanency. The earth shakes, it quakes. Just think of all the things that we place our confidence in we, that we think of as permanent. Think only of money, for example. Most think of money as, an absolute, as absolute security when they should be thinking of money as birds and aerial creatures. Because Proverbs chapter 23 says, Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. Well, this is what people are looking for in this life. They're looking for security, are they not? They find it in money, you see, so often. This is why Spurgeon gave this advice, a very simple advice. But he said, in this life, make sure that you have a loose grip on all of your possessions. Because the Lord can take it away immediately. Immediately. During the Great Depression of 1929, people committed suicide when their fortunes disappeared into thin air. These suicides were referred to by many as philanthropic suicides because these people did not did not want to have to go on the public dough in other words welfare so the psalmist illustrates the chaos the disruption of the earth dislocation of the mountains disturbances of the seas dislocations galore these these four disasters they bring disquietude in our hearts, do they not? You see, the things that we imagine to be impregnable are first the earth and then the eternal mountains. But even the eternal mountains will shake, the psalmist tells us. So you have here in the logic of the psalmist an argument from the greater to the lesser. What's more permanent, the earth or your property that you own? Is the earth, for example, more secure than the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Where would you likely put your money, given these choices, if you had to bet on security? You see, the things that seem most permanent are easily moved by our God, who is the prime mover. He can take it away in <clears throat> one swoop, <clears throat> and it's all gone. And sometimes in very strange ways. Remember traveling across uh, the United States um, some 40 years ago to San Jose. And we had our life savings with us. And I decided not to leave my life savings out in the car uh, <clears throat> where I was feared that somebody would break in and 
abscond with those life savings. So I brought it into the restaurant and put the life savings in a box, sealed box, underneath the table. Well, you know, some breakfast tastes very good, and this breakfast was so delicious that I for we forgot all about our life savings. And we drove down the highway, got about 40 miles out of town. It was in Nebraska, one of those towns, and we remembered what had happened. And we turned around and drove back, and by the grace of God, no one had taken one cent or even opened up the box for that matter. So you can see how quickly it can go. You can just simply forget. Just forget, as we did. And it's gone. It could have been just gone, just like that. Now, obviously, you shouldn't become unglued or unraveled, undone. I don't remember driving 120 miles an hour back to that town in, in Nebraska. Only God is totally re reliable the total time. And the alterations of the earth do not alter God. All the alterations on this terra firma are subject to God's sovereign decrees. Only one power is perfectly stable. Your steadfast faith and your steadfast God. Your faith may fail. I know it's a, a cliche, but the object of your faith doesn't and can't. And notice also here, this is interesting, the, the, mul the multiple trouble here in this psalm is overcome by a, a deducing faith. This psalm is not about one trouble, it's about multiple troubles, serial troubles, consecutive troubles, daily troubles, seas that neither slumber nor rest. Reminds us of the, of the, of the great hymn, hymn number 497 in the old blue Trinity hymnal, but Jesus is Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous seas. Unknown ways before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass came from thee, Jesus Savior, pilot me. And notice the ringing words of confidence in this psalm. He says, the psalmist says, we will not fear, though, 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 though. Four times, four those here in this Psalm 46. Obviously, he had a strong faith. So in other words, you shouldn't fret. If this happens to you, or if that happens to you, or this happens to you, or that happens to you, you shouldn't fret. This is what's called a though, 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 though psalm. And you may have a though, though, though day as well. Now, as I said earlier, the deduction of faith eliminates fear. Therefore, we will not fear, says the psalmist. Now, you could add a lot of things to the list of things that we fear. One of, the, of course, the greatest thing that uh, most people fear, they, they try to hide from it, is the fear of death. Jesus Christ came, remember, to save us from not only death, but also the fear of death. Chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews, read about it there. The idea here is no matter what happens, disruptions in the earth, dislocations of the mountains, disturbances of the seas, we will not fear. David Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this, live in the present to the maximum and do not let your future mortgage your present any more than you should let the past mortgage your present. You see, the heathen, the unbeliever, he says, what if this happens? That's why he's often stricken with ulcers. Your philosophy should be, come what may, though, 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 come what may, you know that yesterday's God and today's God and tomorrow's God. Yesterday's God will be today's God and today's God will be tomorrow's. The pagan, he allows the future to dominate him. He compares his weaknesses to the colossal task before him. He becomes despondent, becomes depressed, becomes miserable because he doesn't know what the future holds for him. He's overwhelmed by, by this fear. He's like Bambi before Godzilla, if I can use an analogy from, what, a Disney cartoon or whatever it is. You see, the unbeliever does not have confidence in the sovereignty of God. The great refrain of this psalm, twice as I said, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. 
Now, you may not be aware that this year, 2019, is the 100th anniversary of a famous book that was written 100 years ago. The name of the book, The Sovereignty of God. I think some of you have read it by Arthur Pink, The Sovereignty of God, written in 1919. And when that book was written, Arthur Pink knew that it wasn't going to be a, was not going to be a commercial success, so there were 2,000 copies that were made of that book. I might add, by way of biography, that that book was instrumental in causing me to, to, uh, to uh, submit myself to the sovereignty of God and to recognize that everything that happens in this world, in, this, in, the, in the cosmos, comes as a result of his sovereign decree. It was a life-changing read. Well, when, book, when uh, Pink wrote the book, he received a letter from somebody that he knew. The letter was, uh, the man had read the book, and, and in the letter he said, I could just kill you for that book that you've just read. Arthur Pink responded, he wrote back and he said to him, no, it is not me that you would like to kill, but it is God that you would like to kill. Well, you can see how unpleasant the doctrine of the sovereignty of God is to, uh, to proud human beings to think that they're the masters of their souls, the captains of their own fate. Well, you should live in the, in the light of the sovereignty of God, especially when there's trouble. The earth may quake, but your heart should not quake. This psalm was written for quaking hearts. Here's the psalmist's message. Everything around me may shake, but I'll never be shaken because God is my refuge and my strength. I hope you can confess that. Well, Trust in the God who also sustains you as well. In verse 4, the psalmist says that he was refreshed with the river. Notice, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. This verse was often alluded to by the Scott Presbyterian minister Robert Murray McShane back in the 19th century. McShane was the Lord's instrument in bringing about a great revival throughout Scotland. Thousands were converted, transformed by the grace of God through his ministry. And when he saw these trophies of God's grace, McShane would often sit back and he would say, Roll on, O river, roll on. Now what is this river then the psalmist speaks about? You might think that it's sort of abruptly introduced, but it really isn't not when you think about it, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. There, Moses says, Now a river went out of Eden and watered the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. See, there's your streams, the four river heads. In paradise, you remember, it didn't rain, yet water was needed. So where would the water come from in paradise? How would, how would our first parents' lives be sustained and their agricultural pursuits be blessed without water? The answer? The river. The river of God. As Gerhardus Voss wrote, the river that makes glad the city of God is a reproduction of the streams of paradise. You see, this river is the river of life. The river of life. Just as Eden's river parted and became four river heads and watered the, watered the earth, so this river parts into streams that refresh the psalmist, that kept him afloat and gave him good cheer. And I say good cheer because you'll see there that this river is a gladdening river. The river makes us joyful. The raging seas may terrify, but the river gladdens the heart of God's people. The heathen roar, but the river provides happiness and comfort. And there is no trouble whatsoever that can rob us of this eternal joy that the Holy Spirit has placed in our hearts. This river supplies us in every single circumstance of life. So the Christian philosophy of trouble isn't grin and bear it or be stoical. Instead, the joy of the Lord, that is our strength. 
So when trouble comes knocking on your door, you should be preoccupied with this river. Don't be fixated on your troubles. Don't be obsessed with the, those negative things. You shouldn't be excess, uh, obsessed with the power of the enemy, such as Hal Lindsey and Satan is alive on planet Earth, where his fixation is the power of the enemy. Or Harold Camping, the late Harold Camping, you recall, that was so fixated on Satan's power that he believed the church went out of existence. The focus of Psalm 46 isn't capital T, trouble so much, but capital R, help. The focus here is upon the river, you see. Faith says, no matter what the circumstances are, there is a river, a river of life that shall sustain me and refresh me. And when you're preoccupied with the river, you'll have happiness. And this explains a great paradox, I believe. You know, you can be incredibly happy when things are disintegrating all around you, just as you can be incredibly miserable when you're luxurate, luxurating or living in clover, as the British like to say to describe a rich person living in clover. Just ask those who win the lottery for confirmation of this. Most of the winners of the, of the, winners of the lottery are losers because they become incredibly happy, unhappy, not happy but unhappy. Or study those who are said to be bipolar and into opioids and other kinds of drugs. Well, if you're in Christ, you have the river, the river of life. And the river of life defeats the river of death. The river of death is no threat to us. Just like Christian in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, remember, forded the river of death. God gave him the strength to go over the river because he had the river of life. Well, our God dwells in our midst, we're told in verse 5. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early or at the crack of dawn, right? At the very crack of dawn. I think that this uh, alludes to the uh, granddaddy of uh, all mornings, and that is when God engulfed the Egyptians, remember, at the Red Sea. The sea closed on them. All that was in the morning. Certainly, this verse teaches the indestructibility of the church. Why is the church indestructible? Because God dwells in her midst. God's city cannot perish as long as God dwells in her. Impossible. The church is like the boat that carried Christ and his disciples across the lake. The disciples cried out, Lord, we perish, you remember. Well, but could they really perish? Could their boat go down? No, not when the Lord of glory slept in the ship. Impossible. Well, finally, the last part of the psalm is, tells us that we're to trust in the God who will slay all, of your, all the troublers. Your God will melt them, it says. Your enemy rages, but your God will melt them like the bomb upon Hiroshima. During the psalmist's lifetime, the rage of the heathen targeted the church. In Psalm 2, we're told the heathen rage against the Lord and against his Christ. But God, all God has to do, as Martin Luther wrote in The Mighty Fortress is Our God, is one little word shall fell them, and they're gone. They're gone. And not only that, God will desolate them, verse 9. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. Now this is an amazing verse, because you would think that the psalmist would ascribe the desolations to the Assyrians, or the Babylonians, or the Persians, or some other foreign power. But notice, he doesn't do that. Why not? Because the Lord himself makes the desolations in the earth. In other words, there is... There is, uh, just as there's disorder and chaos, God will bring cosmos out of chaos. God can bring order out of chaos from desolations. The Greeks used to say, the old Greek philosophers used to say, that world is king. Well, when we look at this psalm, we see that that is simply a lie. 
So here's the point. Not only the dislocations of the mountains and the disruptions of the earth, but the desolations of war are from God as well. And then comes the peace. We're told here that God will break the armaments of these nations. He makes wars to cease and to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear in sunder and burns the chariot in the fire. Our God routs the enemy and turns their swords into plowshares. Isaiah tells about the future, about the reign of Christ. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 9, he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against sword, neither shall they learn war anymore. But, truthfully, before that day comes, there must be judgment. There must be desolations. And then at the very end of the psalm, you're told there that God will shut their mouths as well. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted on the earth. When we read those words, we often are tempted to lower our voices and whisper, be still and know that I am God. But this is really more of a rebuke, a rebuke to the nations, a rebuke to the warring nations. It's a mistake to say that this is a command simply to acknowledge the being of God and no more. No, this verse is for your comfort. God will untrouble you by troubling his enemies. So it's very important that we, we, that we, that we uh, don't teach or, or that we teach the right thing from the right text and not, not, and not the wrong thing from the text. The text basically means this, quiet, cease, and to use an even stronger expression, and I'm not ashamed to say this from the pulpit, God is saying to the nations, shut up, I will be exalted on the earth. Or what Jesus, you remember, said to the storm, peace be still. It was a rebuke of the storm, remember, on the Sea of Galilee. This is a rebuke that we find here in verse 10. God declares that he'll be exalted on the whole earth. And then the psalm concludes, once again, when the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. So how, how in, then are you to receive trouble? By trusting in the sovereignty of God, the Lord of the angel armies. Now, here's something interesting. You're told in Revelation chapter 5 that the number of angels is 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, which if you do your math comes out to about 100 million angels. 100 million angels. Now, would you be brave going to war knowing that you have 100 million angels behind you? Yes, you would. So this refrain is repeated. <clears throat> For good reason, it's to be repeated. There is always more of us than there is of the enemy. The Lord of 100 million angels is on your side, whatever your problem is, whatever your troubles are. So you should have a certain conviction of God's present in your, presence in your life. No less than four times in this psalm, we have is statements. God is, there is a river, God is in the midst of her, and the Lord of hosts is with us. God isn't the great I was or the great I shall be, but the great is. So what God wants you to do is to feast yourself upon the doctrine of God. Don't let your heart be rocked. Don't let your heart be troubled. And don't shake in your boots. You see, the Lord of one million or a hundred million angels is with you because Christ is with you. Christ being the Lord of hosts himself who has authority to summon legions upon legions of angels, which he could have done before he went to the cross. Christ is the center of God's covenant with Jacob, and he promises us the church. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So in time of trouble, 
What God wants you to do is say as Luther did to Melanchthon and to say with enthusiasm, come Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm. Amen.